afternoon. Dwayne here, Dry Creek Wrangler School, uh, down here in South Central Tennessee, uh, working on getting stuff together for the school. And Mom and I just got back uh, from town where we were trying to get some banking done and post office stuff, and and thought we'd come out here. The weather's nice and the light is good. And make a video. I want to tell you a story. Um, in 1993. I was cowboying for the Mooncrest Ranch out of Cody, Wyoming, and uh, summer was coming to a close. I was just a kid. My wife and I had been married for a little while, and we had the one baby, and uh, summer was coming to a close, and, and the work was going to start slowing down, and found out that uh, my wife was expecting our second child, and we were getting kind of homesick, and uh, decided that we wanted to move uh, back to Alaska, where my folks were. So we moved back up and wound up in a, a remote village named McGrath. No roads into it, fly-in only. Uh, and I, I got a job working for a hunting lodge there in the village called Tecusco House. Uh, but it didn't take long for me to figure out that that wasn't, uh, that wasn't really me wasn't very exciting. I spent more time doing laundry and making beds and and cooking meals for the guests and making trips back and forth to the airport. And uh, so I started looking around for something else. And I found out Alaska had this program up there called the VPSO program, Village Public Safety Officer. And so they'd take you and, and send you out to remote Alaska Native Villages for law enforcement, public safety, whatever. And I thought, well, that ought to be some excitement somewhere. So I, uh, I applied, and much to my surprise, I got hired. Turns out they were always desperate to fill these positions. Nobody wanted them. Um, so they flew me down to uh, King Salmon, Alaska, which is down on the Alaska Peninsula, just above the Aleutian chain, to the Alaska State Troopers. And I showed up down there just like I had just come off the ranch. Uh, I was wearing uh, my hat. It was raining. I had my slicker on. I had my high-top uh, Tony Lama buckaroo boots. And, and I showed up. I'm like, well, here I am. So I got the job, and I spent three days there in a the trooper. Now we're going somewhere with this, okay? So hold on. Spent about three days there with the troopers, and they taught me how to, uh, you know, operate handcuffs and, and the basics of some, just some simple stuff. They gave me a shirt, a uniform shirt uh, with a badge, a, a set of handcuffs that had surface rust on them, and a PR-24 nightstick. That's it. They put me on a bush plane and flew me 100 miles south to a little native village called Pilot Point dropped me off and said, good luck. Uh, when we get an opening in the academy, we'll send you. If you need help, call us. There were no roads. Only way to get down there was by bush plane uh, if the weather would allow. So, I, and then they got in the plane and flew away. And I was, like I said, this was in 93. And so I was 20, 26, 27 years old. Uh, before long, my wife came down we, and, uh, our, the second baby had been born by then. So she had two little babies and it was difficult. Now I'm not going to speak culturally, politically. I'm just going to speak realistically. Okay. The folks there, when I arrived, they didn't know me, but they didn't like me. A lot of them. The village was only like a hundred people. First off, I was white. Now, I'm not speaking to the right and the wrong. I'm just speaking to reality, what it was, okay? I'm not saying who had the right to feel what, historically this. I'm just saying this is a reality of it, okay? I was white. I was southern white, and I was law enforcement. And so the doors were not flung open wide, and they did not fall on my neck and kiss me out of joy for my arrival, okay? And I was young. I was thousands of miles from home and I had a young family. I had a dangerous job and I had no training. The mayor of that little village, his name was Sonny Gredigan. I still remember his name. 
Sonny um, was, he was part Russian, part Aleut, and uh, his, his family, that, that village, and he was the mayor. One day, Sonny came up and he gave me a cigar. Uh, it was, I do believe to this day, I, best I can remember, it was a Romeo y Julieta. I don't remember what size. I don't remember anything else about it. That name just had a romantic touch to me, and so it stuck in my mind. Uh, and he helped me light it, and uh, and I remember I thought it was pretty good. I couldn't finish it in one sitting. It was too much. And throughout my time there, he would just from time to time, he'd come up, he'd bring have some in, and he'd come up and hand me a cigar, and we'd sit there and have a cigar. Now, I haven't seen him since I left, and that was, and I left in 94, so that was a lot of years ago. I, I don't think, in fact, I know he never knew what that meant to me. I mean, there we were. I was white. He was native. I was southern country. He was northern village. I was law enforcement. I was young. He was more mature. But at that moment, moment over that cigar, it just didn't matter. We were equals. That was my introduction to the brotherhood of the leaf, if you will. Now, when I left there, I didn't have any more cigars for a while. I smoked a pipe for years. We wound up in North Carolina, and I won't go into the details, but I was kind of isolated to a degree at that point. Didn't have, um, well, I was just in a place, okay? And so I went downtown with my son-in-law to a shop to pick up some pipe tobacco. And uh, they had some cigars there. And I saw those cigars and just something in the back of my mind just took me back to that point where Sonny had just reached out to a, a frightened young man who was way out of his element with a small gesture that just meant so much. And... I picked up a cigar. I had no idea what it was. It, it was a Charter Oak Connecticut shade. I didn't know anything about them. But I picked one up, took it home, got on YouTube and looked up how to cut them, how to light them, and I lit that thing up. And it was instantly, I was like, I'm home. There was something, it brought me back. There was something there. Now, you know, people talk about the the uh, palette and how you know you get the essence of dark chocolate and leather and cedar and oak or whatever i didn't get any of that my palette is still not refined refined but what i got was was um just this is right now what was it let's say last month two months ago I was wrangling there in Rancho Cortez, and we had some guests come in. Went to, uh, got them ready and got ready to take them out. And I pulled my case out of my pocket and pulled out a cigar and clipped the end of it and lit it, getting ready to mount up and go. And I heard behind me, oh man, I wish I had known. I'd have brought my cigars. And I turned around and looked, and there was about a, 40 45 year old black man standing there now he was very he was very muscular and he had he had the hair like um i have no idea i'm just a dumb white boy it's it's really cool hair that some some fellas some black fellas have it wasn't it wasn't all mess like like a lot of these kids have this rastafarian hair but it was like you know big massive um it was really cool but, and he was dressed urban, um, and uh, it, it wasn't, you know, I turned around and looked, and, and there was, but he's like, man, if I had no eyes. So I turned and looked at him, I said, you smoke cigars? He's like, yeah. I said, hold on just a minute. And I jumped in the little Kawasaki mule and ran up to my trailer and grabbed a Charter Oak Connecticut shade, brought it back, handed it to him with my, with my uh, cutters and lighter and said, here you go. He's like, oh, man. So we went on that ride with the rest of the guests and enjoyed cigars together. And again, 
there was an instant brotherhood. It wasn't, I was white, he was black, he was urban, I was country, he was this, I was that. We were just brothers of the leaf. Brothers of the leaf. Just before I left down there, there's a really big cigar store in Halotis, Texas. Um, and I had been there once before. And I decided to go back. I had a day off. I had some time on my hands, and so I went back. And they had two cigar lounges inside and tables outside. So I went down there, and I went inside, and I picked up two or three good, look like good cigars that I wanted to try. I bought them. It was a beautiful day, so I come out on the sidewalk, and I wanted to sit at a table and have a good cup of coffee and, uh, and enjoy my cigar. But there were guys at both tables. And so I walked out, and I didn't want to trouble anybody, and so I kind of hesitated for a second. And this table around the corner, there were two guys sitting there, and one of them saw my hesitation. He's like, hey, man, come over here and sit with us. Come on over here. So I went over and sat down. And the guy that has spoken was 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 a large uh, Hispanic fella, and the guy that was sitting here with him was also um, uh, Hispanic and a slightly older and smaller. And we sat down and started talking and and had a real good talk. I mean, I was dressed like I am. They're like, "What do you do? Where are you from?" And we got to talking. The one guy was in real estate, extremely successful, and I didn't know what the other guy did. And after a while, he was super friendly, and, and he got up to leave. And uh, the fellow said, yeah, he's a talent scout for a major league baseball team. And uh, so he, we got talking cigars, and he's like, here, try one of these. He had no band or anything on it. And uh, so I lit it up, and it was mind-blowing how flavorful and smooth and high quality this no-name, no-band cigar was. I was blown away. I'm like, man, where do you get these? And he said, from that guy that was just here. And I'm like, has he got any more? Yeah, he does. And uh, so he called him and said, hey, can you bring some more down? And uh, I said, look, I'll take a bundle if you're going to come all the way back down here. He told me how much they were. I could not believe how inexpensive they were. I said, I'll tell you what, if you're going to come all the way back down here, I'll take two bundles. After about 30 minutes, he came back down with those two bundles and a big bundle of others. He said, I've had these aging for five years. Happy New Year, I'm in a given spirit. And he, and he gave me that bundle. Come find out, he sells these, uh, and all the profit goes to a nonprofit for handicapped children. So anyhow, there's a reason why I'm telling you this. I went home, and I, I wound up down at Brian's, and I was telling him the story, and he's like, I know, I, he said, I know baseball. He said, I know baseball pretty good. What was the guy's name? And I said, it was, I think it was something like this. And he gave me a name. I said, that sounds right. He said, man, that guy is very well known in Major League Baseball. And so I got online and Googled him up, and there he was. He's a talent scout, a very well-known talent scout for a Major League Baseball team. Now, I'm not going to uh, invade his privacy on the Internet. I'm not going to give you any more than that, but I never knew. So you got a very successful real estate developer. you got a talent scout for a Major League Baseball team. And you got an old cowboy sitting around. And what is the common thing? It's the brotherhood of the leaf. Listen, you can't find that in just about anywhere else. You can't find it in church anymore. There's no brotherhood in church unless you're in that one particular church, putting money in that particular plate, uh, following their particular creed. You don't find it in politics. We're ripping this country apart uh, through politics. You can't find it in culture. Uh, you go to your job and how many, how many people go to the job and it's just bickering and fighting and clawing and scratching. You go to the family dinner table and families are torn apart because they can't, can't quit talking about religion and politics. Um, and there is a brotherhood in cigars. To me, that is the, th the ultimate thing. Now, you folks who get on here and you scratch and yell and weep and well and gnash your teeth about the evils of cigars, we don't care. And what it sounds like to me is you're not allowed at the grown-ups table. 
And since you can't sit at the grown-ups table because you don't want to sit at the grown-ups table, you throw your mashed potatoes from the kitty table to the grown-ups table. Um, keep going, okay? Just just keep getting on there and, and just, just keep weeping and wailing and gnashing your teeth because I guarantee we don't care because we found something that you haven't found. And guys and gals, we got to stop ripping each other apart. We got to find something that we can come together over. And the things that should bring us together aren't bringing us together anymore. And I have found something that everywhere I go, every cigar shop I go into, every cigar lounge I sit down at, I find someone who comes up and sits down and just start talking. And we're equals. And we're equals. And I'm not going to let you take that away from me. All right? So don't know why, but maybe somebody needs that. Maybe to help you. And maybe somebody else couldn't find anything to bellyache about today, so I just gave you something. So there you go. You're welcome. All right, I hope you like it. Click like if you did. Subscribe if you haven't. Uh, click on that button, uh, share, and send it off to somebody who thought you who you think might like it. The school is coming together very well. May is basically pretty well booked up. June is pretty well booked up. We booked into July today. We're not booking very much in July. We're not booking anything in August, and then we'll come back and start over in September, October, maybe November. So if you're interested in the school, uh, you need to get a hold of us um, and uh, so you can get your, your spot locked in. Um, you got any questions or anything, the website has the phone number, has the address and whatnot, and you can get a hold of us. And so if you're interested in that, we, we'd love to talk to you. Uh, so until then, chill out. Chill out. Be good. And we'll talk to you guys next time.